Welcome to Scribbler Describe. I'm your host, David Scribbler Wishart, and I'm joined by my co-host, resident scribe, Pastor Ronnie Smith from Peace Lutheran Church. We invite you on a spiritual journey to explore questions of faith and the human experience. If you're searching for more meaning in your life, you're not alone. So join us as we search for wisdom and personal growth through a theological lens. Um, yeah, so last week we were going to dig into this and we kind of went in a different direction. Uh, but, you know, when I think about what a lot of people who are struggling with coming back to a life where the church is more involved, you know, part of their regular week and, and part of their regular life, I think there's a lot of cynicism uh, that that's in the way for, for many people. And one of the things that they question that they probably keep coming back to is, you know, if God has all this power and, and God, you know, can do whatever he wants. So if God's all powerful, like why do bad things happen? Why do I struggle and bad people prosper? Why does everything seem so unfair? And I think that people have a hard time getting over that struggle. So I want to, open that to you and, and just say, like, listen, if God could prevent bad things from happening, why do they happen? Right. Um, not to be confused with God is making bad things happen to you. That's which is another common refrain. Mm -hmm. um, we, we take things very personally as humans. When it happens to us, it becomes so personal. But when it happens to someone else, you know, we can be philosophical about it and entertain lots of different ideas about that. But for some reason, when it happens to us, it gets very personal. And uh, it's like we take it personally with God in a sense, like, God, what are you doing to me? As if God's going around, you know, afflicting people just for fun kind of thing. Um, it's only when we sort of... Uh, you know, overcome the constraints of our own ego that we start to see a bigger picture, I guess. And funny enough, I'm remind whenever I hear this question, I'm reminded of the Lion King. If you recall, Mufasa was the king and Simba is the little guy and they're up on the cliff and he's dropping some wisdom on his head. Um, and he tells a story about how you know, the, how the lions eat the deer. And that seems so unfair, right? Why do the, why do the lions eat the deer? You know, there's, it's a violent act, if you will. And, but then Mufasa explains how that when the lion dies, becomes part of the soil and, you know, nourishes the ground that grows the grass that the deer eats. And so in a sense, they're both eating each other. It's the cycle of life kind of thing. But if you're a deer, that sure does fall on deaf ears. Mm -hmm. um, but if you sort of zoom out and remove your own person from that, you can see that something greater is happening. Something bigger than, than you, bigger than me happening. And that doesn't, that might be cold comfort to some people, especially if you're the one in the thick of the crap. Um, but I'm always reminded of that, of that story. And I try to just keep that perspective. So I don't think God is going around picking and choosing who gets what and, and how much crap they have to take because there is a lot of injustice in the world and a lot of inequity um and but i've even seen on facebook things like um you know people asking the same question why does god allow you know war and famine and violence and poverty and then the question is why do we allow those things so most often if not every time it's we're doing that to each other those things where if we're um if we're neglecting 
someone that's not God doing that, that's us. Or if, if we engage in violence or, um, you know, basically anything that's a selfish act that could be considered a selfish act, um, that's our doing. That's not God's doing. God has already given everything. There's plenty of resources here for everyone to live. And, but some of us hoard these things and not everybody gets the benefits of an even distribution, if you will. Well, you know, and I, I think um, there's a bunch of things that what you said bring to mind. So I'll uh, take it back to a personal experience of my own um, that I think about in, from a time when I was in a, like a darker place. But, you know, my wife um, back in 2014 was diagnosed with um, an autoimmune disease uh, type one diabetes. And so when we found out about that, it felt very shocking and unfair. And, you know, you get these questions of, you know, why her and, and why us, why is this happening to our family? And, you know, our son had just been born and then what does that mean for him? And, you know, you, you get into just a lot of fear and uncertainty about trying to make sense of, you know, this new thing that's in your life that you feel is going to take away from what you hoped or envisioned life being like. And over time though, there's this period where you, you do, you, you get over yourself and you look at, okay, how can I take this difficulty that I'm experiencing and turn it into something good? Because if I just sit here and dwell on it, it it's torture, you know, um, you, you, it, but if instead you say, okay, you know what, I'm not going to let this defeat me. I'm going to defeat it. And I'm going to rise above the challenge that, that that's been presented. So uh, what has happened since then in, in our families, I feel as if we're probably in a stronger place than we would have been had that not occurred because it, it humbles you, it, it matures you. And more practically speaking, we've been um, big fundraisers for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. So our, you know, I captain team people and we've raised over $20,000 since 2014. Sweet. Um, you know, for, for type one diabetes research. So uh, that's something that we wouldn't have done as on a contribution that we would have made or anything to the world. And, and so sometimes, and this is going to go into my next question is, challenges are given to the people who are best able to uh, manage them and take care of them. And that, you know, we're, we're put in a position to do the best thing we can in the world. It's up to us whether we're going to kind of rise to the occasion or not. Do you think that there's some truth to that? Is there, you know, tests of different people and their capabilities and how this is, or is it more random, you know, why some bad things happen or... Um. Uh, you hear that a lot. And another way of people to say that is God doesn't give us more than we can handle. And, and there are a lot of axioms like that out there. Um, but that would then suggest that God is intentionally afflicting you with something just to test you a lot like in the book of Job, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of great wisdom and, and teaching in that book. But on the other hand, it's not the God that I believe in God that's going around willy nilly picking on people. That's not a God that I follow. It's not a God. I feel like that. I know I have a close relationship with. Um, so, and I, I don't mean to judge anybody who uses that as a mantra. I mean, you know, whatever works for you to get through the crap. Um, but um you know, think how many billions of people have ever lived. And if you take any organism and reproduce it that many times, you're going to get variances. And sometimes, you know, things just misfire. They don't work properly or 
could be environmental factors. Maybe your mom smoked or maybe you're, or, or something, or maybe you were abused as a child or were neglected and didn't get enough nutrition. And later on you develop something, or uh, maybe there's something in our deodorant, like, or all the processed stuff in our foods. We've really been poisoning ourselves ever since the industrial revolution, essentially like land, water, air, it's, it's all pervasive. And when you introduce all those toxins into, you know, the birthing process, you're going to get defects and people are going to have shortcomings here and there. And there's probably a certain element of that naturally anyways. Uh, but we've certainly not made it any easier on ourselves. Um, so again, I would, I would say, why do we allow all of those things? And then when it, things don't work out, we're quick to point the finger at God. Oh, it must've been God's fault. Um, but then it's that personal thing again, right? Like, um, if all you, if your whole life is dedicated to being all about yourself, you're going to see that wherever you turn. But if you're able to transcend yourself in a sense, uh, and you know, what would be a way to say it rather than uh, appealing to your, your, your basis of instincts appeal to your higher um, being, I guess, or connect your, the, the divineness that's in all of us, the spirit. Um, you start to see that um, taking those things personally is not going to get you very far. Um, so much of humans, I'd say there's far more suffering, uh, across humanity at the hands of other humans uh, that we need to deal with before we start pinning it on God. But a lot of people don't want to do that work, right? That's grueling lifelong uh, discernment and evolution and struggle and challenge. Uh, but that's what it takes. So let's, I think that's an interesting answer. Um, and I think, yeah, you know, <laughs> you, when you say that, like, I, I think about, okay, am I reading into this in a way that is working for me? Maybe that doesn't matter. Like, it, you know, you take what you, you need out of different situations. I mean, we talk in other contexts about how, you know, you have to be very careful with reading the Bible because you can interpret it and take whatever you want into it, good or bad. Um, in different situations. Uh, I think there's probably nothing wrong if you look at something that's going to provide you with personal strength and you're going to do good in the world as a result of that. But you bring up a good point that there's lots of explanations uh, for these things that happen. And so uh, to be open-minded to the different contexts, because just because that works for you could be an you know, a discussion that falls very flat for somebody else in their own experience. When we think about science in the modern age and what we know now versus what we knew or what people knew back when the Bible stories were written. A lot of the things back then people may have attributed to God, which we would attribute today to our understanding of science and physics and, uh, as a result of that, you know, now we believe the world is round and once we thought it was flat. And uh, so given that higher level of understanding, you can sort of see a world where people just basically explain away God or something like God was just filling in the blanks there for things that couldn't be explained by science. And is that a risk or is there, is there some, contradictions in the two's existence or how do we reconcile those those ideas right so in the, in the old days in the ancient days i i would wager that they knew more about things of the spirit than we do now because we're so we've got waves and signals flying around us all the time we're you know looking at devices and we're not out in nature like we used to be and 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 these sorts of things Having said that, we've come a long way medically, scientifically. And so now, now we look at the Bible and we think, oh, well, if someone's convulsing, maybe they were prone to seizures or something like that. Whereas in the old days, we'd say, 
they would have just said it's a demon. If you didn't know what it was, it was a demon, sort of just chalked up to that. Or an unclean spirit is another uh, phrase that gets used. Um, but one, one big thing that happened in between those two points, I guess, is that the Enlightenment came along and uh, the age of reason and everything had to be observable and repeatable before we would accept it as true. And um, so science gets pitted against religion in that environment. Um, and those two forces have been battling each other ever since, I guess. And what we're finding now is that they're not two different things. Uh, they're very mutually um, beneficial to each other, I guess, if you will. They're very interrelated. They're not two separate things. And, um, you know, science is starting to catch up on, on some spirituality things. Like when we talk about uh, in our Lenten series, David's going to tell us about how it's going to talk about quantum physics or something like that, how we're all made of light. Everything is made of light. Um, and um, even though you can't see that, well, we can't see it to the naked eye, but they're, they're coming up with remarkable discoveries that actually bring us closer to proving God than disproving God, in a sense. And a really simple analogy here is, uh, well, um, you can't see the wind but um, we know it's there. You can put things up to, to sort of measure the resistance, I guess, and the pressure that it's creating and say, oh, we know it's this many kilometers an hour and things like that. But you can never see it. You can never tell when it's gonna change directions and so on and so forth. Um, so there's an invisible thing that we can't prove well, I guess we can prove by putting things in the way, I guess, but that's not really a complete answer. Uh, but there's something there that uh, we can't see, but we know it's a thing. So similarly, uh, the, the Holy Spirit is like the breath of God, uh, breathing, f flowing, whatever word you want to say, through all creation, everything that is, um, whether that's in light form or actual movement of air molecules. I'm not really sure. It's not my forte, but David can explain this stuff in much better uh, fashion. So do check into that. Really hope you can make that. Uh, but anyway, so he's a spiritual scientist essentially. And, and what they're finding is that a lot of the ancient wisdom is, is a lot more accurate than we, we might have thought. And, you know, especially in the age of in this age of science and medical innovations and things like that, it's really tempting for us um, to think we're so great and we got it all figured out and we know everything. Um, but we all, everyone can admit that there's more out there than any one of us can perceive. And, um, you only need to look to space to, to begin to imagine that. But that's speaking of space, that's another thing. In the old days, in ancient times, they spent a lot more time looking up at the sky, looking up at the night sky. And, you know, I'm sure they had some backward ideas about what they're seeing at different times and not like we've got it all figured out by any stretch. Um, latest sort of uh, astronomical sort of uh, innovations have only given us, have only showed us how much we don't know. Like, you know, yeah, we can see some galaxies and things like that. It's, it's a learning, it's a adding knowledge to the human race, but we didn't realize how minuscule we really were until we started to explore space. And uh, it's good to remember that how small we are because most of our problems happen when we puff ourselves up to be bigger than we are and to make ourselves out to be more important or more special than we have any right to be, I guess. How do you avoid feelings of uh, nihilism in that, that kind of environment where you are a speck of dust in the universe and does any of it matter? Like, it's good to not have that ego and puff ourselves up too much, but how do you avoid the opposite of just feeling insignificant and, 
and, and pointless in that that huge cosmos that that's out there. Well, every time I hear nihilist, I think of the Big Lebowski. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but Many times. <laughs> it's hard to not make jokes off of that right now. Yeah. Um, I can't speak for everyone. I've been I all I can say is I've been so blessed to to take such delight in life, I guess. I've just always been happy go lucky, I guess. I don't I don't need anything to be happy and um I know that's not true for everyone. And it's, you know, a lot of times it's easy for me to say some of this stuff because I've never really had to endure any great suffering or anything like that. Um, but I, I say to people, you know, yes, we're insignificant in that way. If you, if you want to get down to it, but, but this life does matter. It, it, as long as I have breath, I'm going to, I'm going to believe that with everything that I have but I can't give that to somebody else. You know, that's just sort of my posture or my disposition or, or whatever you want to say. And so maybe that's cold comfort to some. Um, but I do, I've always deeply felt that every single one of us matters somehow. And in every single one of us is worth our best. Um, and I guess I get, I just, I just find, like I said, great delight in that. And uh, the more you live for others, you you start to cultivate that in yourself. You know, one of, we've said a few times, the most selfish thing you can do is serve others because you get so much back when you do that. If you're feeling hopeless, feeling like you got no purpose, go help someone and see if you if your attitude changes, see if your mood changes. Mm -hmm. um, well, but a I, lot of people they don't want to do that i guess for some reason or some people feel crippled by their own the weight of their own uh situation and you know my story there is not going to help them in a sense i can't really give that to someone um but you know at, at, on some level we all have to dig deep into ourselves and, and find that meaning. And, and, and in some ways, you know, when we do that for others and you, it, I, I sort of think of like all this selfishness and, and inward thinking is sort of like a vacuum that sucks energy out of the world. And mm -hmm. um, whereas when you help others, yeah, it might be small, like this dust like particle in the grand scheme of the universe, but the thing is, is that collectively, all of us together are more than just that. And to the extent that you ignite some energy in other people by doing those things, and they continue to pay that forward, you can create a virtuous cycle that creates something much better. And so you can kick off, um, you can either choose to, to kick off the positive cycle or, or you know, retract into a negative one. It's up to each of one of us in the day of what universe we wanna create. So I read like a, an interesting um, book that, that talked about, um, oh, what was it called? Dark Matter, I think by an author, Blake Crouch. It's a good sci-fi novel, but he, you know, he talks about, um, you know, multiple dimensions and sort of, you know, about, it's kind of about like time travel, but also just about how life forks off into all these different paths. And so, you know, you say you have an infinite corridor of doors that you can go through and each one represents some split in the decision tree of life where you could go. And it's like, yeah, I mean, your actions can create all these universes and every one of us is all in that same thing of what we, what tomorrow is we can, we can create for each other. And so there's one out there somewhere that is the collection of everybody doing the kind thing to serving others that is some utopian environment compared to the one where we're all, you know, living for ourselves and, and you can just see how all those things can go, go wrong. And, um, you know, what kind of negative or positive energy is really coursing through each one of those. Yeah, absolutely. We, we each get that choice every single day, how to respond to what's put in front of us. Uh, but back to your question about, you know, why does it matter? Why do I matter? And, 
if we're just specks of dust, um, I'm reminded of another cartoon. I forget where it was from, but uh, there was like, uh, I think a man and a boy walking along the beach. And um, the kid threw, oh, so, so the beach is littered with like starfish and things like that. And the, the boy threw a starfish back in the ocean and the adults like, well, why'd you do that for? There's so many of them here. Like, it doesn't matter. And the boy's like, well, it mattered to that one that, that he did that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they both looked at that same situation in two totally different ways. What I'll do is one of the questions that he's asked me is I can put this on you for all the kids out there who are obviously listening to our podcast. Naturally. <laughs> adults but no seriously though uh one of the things he asks is who created god and so this idea of like did it start somewhere and i feel like i don't have a good answer for him other than i think that that's a construct of us trying to force time on god but i want to hear what your thoughts are about 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 that like that's an excellent question uh, with no real answer, I guess. And so I take delight in such questions because I just like to bask in that not knowing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to translate that for people or, or to make it accessible, but it's just something I've just come to appreciate in life. We talked a little bit uh, last time about control and sort of hinting at, you know, get used to not being in control and see how your life opens up or something like that. Uh, but I am reminded of another sort of uh, anecdote. I, I was on internship in uh, St. Matthew's in Kitchener. Um, Pastor David Molina was my internship supervisor and another gentleman, Jeff Snyder was in there and they were debating on, um, I think the question was something like, can God make an object so heavy that even God couldn't lift it up? And uh, one of them, I think, was saying, arguing, yeah, and the other one was arguing, no, something like that. And I was just listening, and then they asked me, and then I said, <laughs> very cleverly, I said, do not test the Lord your God. <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, which I think is the sort of uh, dwelling in the not knowing, <clears throat> taking delight, <clears throat> excuse me, in not knowing. It circles back to something we were talking about earlier because you talk about back in the time you know, when Jesus was walking the earth and, and the, the, you know, the original Bible scripture was being, being written. There was probably a greater comfort in not knowing and giving it up to God and just allowing these things to be unexplained. Right. And as you move to that period of the enlightenment and everything needs to be observed and tested and uh, you need data and. Uh, and we're so skeptical now. Yeah. It, <clears throat> it, it forces everything to have an answer. And I will say from my own personal experience in control and anxiety, one of the big sources of that is trying to solve all the problems and being able and available to solve the problems that come your way. But there's a fallacy in that because it's impossible to solve everything. Um, some problems cannot be solved. Others are not worth solving for you in that moment in time. Um, whatever the case may be, having that acceptance and being willing to just say, you know what, maybe this doesn't have an answer and it doesn't need one. And right. <clears throat> moving along in your life, you, you don't torture yourself with trying to make all that fit together. Right. So, well, there you go. Yeah. Solving all the words. <laughs> I don't even have to say anything to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Why are you even here? <laughs> Um, I have another question. I think it sort of fits into maybe a different podcast. 
than this one. Yeah, but and you, and you got to think two minutes left on your uh, five minute check in. I do. Yeah, so you might not be able to answer this one in time, but it's something that I'm going to forget about it if I don't ask it now. All right, go for it. So talking about science, let's say hypothetically speaking, we invent some kind of gene therapy or medicine or something that allows us to effectively live forever. So humans um, no longer, uh, the physical body doesn't die. And so we, you know, of course, under the belief that, you know, when you die, your spirit goes to heaven. But what happens in that, that environment where maybe we, we've changed those rules and now we're living in this other um, uh, you know, structure of life. Uh, does that, what does that mean? Can we still find heaven on earth or does it, are we, are we in competition with God by doing something like that? What does that, what does that look like? I don't necessarily expect you to have an answer for this. I just want to put it out there as a, it's a, a slip. Bubble. It's a slippery slope, that's for sure. And funny enough, I'm reminded of some Rush lyrics of the song Xanadu. I don't know if you know that one. But it's about Kublai Khan search for immortality. And in the end, um, realizes that it's a curse. Mm -hmm. And that it's a good thing that we all pass from this realm. Um, so if you live forever, think of, you know, if... Um, if everyone you loved around you died and you had to go through that over and over and over again, mm -hmm. or if there was any kind of problem or any kind of suffering in any kind of way, you'd have to deal with that forever. And it's just like torture for your soul. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe your soul might be like, peace, I'm out of here someday. I had enough of this torture. I don't know. But of course this is all hypothetical and I'm not afraid to go there. It's fun to entertain such uh wild notions i guess um, but it's not anything i'm in pursuit of i think this life is good enough for me you know someone's you know everyone's heard the saying you only live once and i i refute that saying i get to live 365 times a year mm -hmm. until the last so every day is a new life every every breath is a prayer and uh you know i just see god everywhere and uh when's my time i guess i've had you know i don't want to get too sci-fi here but i've had a vision i guess of of have what people call heaven i guess where your spirit goes when you die and uh <clears throat> the the message i received in that vision was that don't worry when you die you're gonna come here with the other spirits, I guess. And uh, so I've just got this incredible peace. It, it's, it was such a blessing. I had that vision like 20 years ago and it's still as fresh as if it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been able to, it's allowed me to sort of live with courage, I guess, in a sense. And um, what a gift, you know, like being touched by the hand of God, I guess. I mean, we all are, but who can perceive it? Well, and that's the, the, the quest for like physical immortality on earth, maybe just a fear of the, the future and the unknown. And that when you don't have that fear, you don't have that want to, to live forever. And there's something just maybe perhaps egotistical about that. It's an idea that I've wanted to develop into a, a story about it you know a husband and wife and the husband wants to go through with this treatment to you know live forever and the wife is not keen at all on it and it becomes this this complete um debate in their marriage that kind of destroys what they have well there you go that's the first problem right there right talk about a slippery slope and uh being a curse mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to explore that with you just to get wild and crazy. That'd be fun. Yeah. I think these kind of ideas are, are really interesting to explore because just challenge our way of thinking and you can kind of peel back the layers of the onion and that's all. Seems. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing there too is I'm not worth keeping alive forever. Like who am I that should, that should happen to? 
You're the scribe, man. You're <laughs> Ronnie Smith. No, seriously, though, it's Lots been a great luck. chat. And I think we covered lots of good ground in the time we had. Yeah, uh, we got a couple epis in there for sure. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, next week, I think we're moving on to the idea of human and or the divine and just getting into who Jesus was as, you know, a man versus Jesus as the son of God and, and kind of digging through that and, and trying to find a more relatable, um, you know, uh, savior, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Right. But I think we can dig into that. That'll be an interesting discussion. I think we can find ways for people to connect in the 21st century better. Let's hope that's the, yeah. that's, that's what we're aiming for. Yeah. That'd be great. Okay. Thanks so well, much, David. Yeah. Thanks again. We hope you found your time nourishing and life giving. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. If you would like to hear more and support the podcast and Peace Lutheran Church, please consider donating at the link in the description. For DW, I'm Pastor Ronnie Smith. Peace be with you.